Okay, okay. All right. We're live on air, everybody. Welcome. We are the blockchainers. This is the blockchainers with our interview. We're propagating from the heart of Korea to, to try to tell the world and the internet about everything that is going on in the blockchain and the crypto ecosystem in Korea, bringing you news, interviews, and general goodness and that Korean soul. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Today we have a very, 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 very special guest, the venerable, the most honored, honor, honored uh, Ned Scott, CEO of Steemit. Welcome, Ned. Hey guys, thanks for having me on. Very excited to be talking to the Korean community. Um, let's have at it. Very excited. Okay, yeah. So yeah, before we start, let's just uh, like like there's like four of us in the chat room. Let's just go around introducing ourselves to our audiences who might not be familiar with some of the faces. Hi, my name is Sian and I'm a co-host of the Blockchainers. Um, hi guys, uh, my name is Yonghun. I'm the, um, also the co-host of the Blockchainers. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And hi, uh, my name is Henry. I'm a friend of um, Yonghun and Sian. I'm here to help you guys um, translate in words in YouTube. And hi guys, I'm Ned, CEO of Steemit, and the creator of Smart Media Tokens. Yeah, Smart Media Tokens. Well, yeah, we'll, we're, we're definitely going to have to talk about that today. <laughs> cool. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's start. Um, let's start from the very, let's just, let's just go way back. Like, how did Steemit start? Who'd you, who'd you start with? Yeah, so uh, Steemit is a culmination of lots of years in crypto. I, I got into Bitcoin in 2013. I fell in love with Bitcoin and I spent all my time thinking about it. I pretty much gave up everything else and I started just doing meetups and meetings constantly and just reading constantly like during my day job, just like browsing forums and reading. And it just grew and grew and started to take on more and more traction until I had met people that I could actually start ventures with or, you know, I could go out and have real business meetings uh, and, 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 and figure out, you know, some potential plans. And towards middle 2015, uh, I had gotten together with some developers and some groups in the space. And, um, yeah, there was uh, uh, one, uh, a couple developers in particular that we were able to come together with and basically form the ideas for Steam. And uh, we started a company at the very beginning of 2016 with the idea that we would build this blockchain that had the properties that allowed it to be scalable and also support social media applications. We would come out with that. And then later we would come out with a social media application on top of that that would be sort of like a Reddit sort of a, a community forum uh, combined with, um, you know, a digital wallet for cryptocurrency and a special cryptocurrency that also integrated with people's actions on the site uh, such that as they, you know, posted and created content for the community, they would be rewarded with cryptocurrency. And we felt that that sort of mechanic would allow us to see the cryptocurrency be bootstrapped at a faster rate than we've ever seen before. And that's held true. And since then, we've learned a ton of things. And we've started to apply our knowledge uh, and our experience to new features and new developments on the blockchain that I think are going to be even bigger. And now we're onto something called smart media tokens as an add-on to Steam to basically enable other websites to do, you know, and have the success that we've had with, with Steemit. So I now look at Steemit as the future of the content internet. And in five years, no more than five years, we will see thousands of websites that have tokens integrated at the highest level where average regular people are interacting with those websites and are earning cryptocurrency. So the future for me is to tokenize the content web with cryptocurrencies. Yeah, that's a, that's a great vision. And um, I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. Uh, but, the, you know, like, I know a lot of viewers, and I've seen, like, hateful comments on YouTube on your other interviews, but can you please explain the difference between Steam, Steemit, and then, like, can you explain a little bit about the Steam ecosystem? Yeah, sure. So, so um, Steam, Steam with, with uh, a capital S and then lowercase t-e-e-m, is Steam the blockchain. That's the entire service. Um, 
you know, all of the code that makes up um, the mechanics that support the cryptocurrency, that support the data that goes into this secure database and distributed database. That's STEAM. And then there's STEAM, all caps. That represents the native currency that is riding through the blockchain STEAM and is what is, um, you know, supporting the network's, um, you know, creation of content. It's also supporting block production and um, is ultimately the currency that, that we want to see get bootstrapped globally. Uh, there's also Steam It with an IT at the end there, and that is just a social media application built on top of Steam. It essentially uses the blockchain as an API to all of the post data and all the cryptocurrency data and then funnels it through into an interface. That's, that's what Steamit.com is. So there is no Steam It blockchain. There's just Steam, the blockchain, and that's a totally decentralized and distributed thing. It's not something that Steemit or the company behind Steemit runs. It's, it's, it's separate entities. And the way that I can show that further is there are several uh, interfaces that plug into Steam already that are viable businesses. There's busy.org, chainbb.com, dtube.video, dsound.audio. These are all interfaces that are plugged into the Steam blockchain to take advantage of the... Um, the cryptocurrency in a way that allows them to grow their user base and run a business and monetize their interface. So, uh, yeah, it's really those three things to break out there. There's Steam the blockchain, Steam the cryptocurrency that's written as all caps, and there's Steamit.com amongst many other interfaces, Busy, ChainBB, etc. So, to me, that's the Steam ecosystem. The Steam ecosystem is, is the blockchain plus all the applications on top. And with the advent of smart media tokens, I can only hope to see the ecosystem grow more and more and more. So smart media tokens, well, I'll, I'll let you pick that up when you want. But yeah, those, those are the three definitions for me. Um, so with the, what, what you said, I think a lot of people are very familiar with what you've said, with, the, with, the, um, with at least Steemit, right? But when it comes down to the other interfaces, especially like the tube or you know, the, the audio, how is that like can is it even you know like there's a whole thing with like ipfs and you know ethereum is trying to do its own storage and whatnot how like did you is it okay in terms of bandwidth like how are how are those interfaces yeah i mean as far as steam con is concerned it's it's totally fine you know basically the entrepreneur what they're doing is they're using the interface like a glue and behind the interface, there are actually, there's, there's pretty much two different protocols running. You have Steam, so the entrepreneur is running a Steam node. And then there's also IPFS, so they're also running IPFS nodes. And they're just merging the data up into the interface to, to bring it all together. Um, and that's fine. I, you know, I, I don't know exactly how IPFS is running today. I believe there's some sort of subsidies going on from some organization that's paying for that bandwidth. Mm -hmm. And that's, I believe, helping to bootstrap some of these businesses. Um, and in the future, maybe the economics will change a little bit for IPFS with the whole Filecoin launch. Uh, but it's unclear yet. But, um, you know, I, I, I think what we're seeing as far as experimentation on top of Steam is very interesting. The idea that entrepreneurs can combine, you know, several new protocols to create apps that are... Gain, getting an edge on the incumbents like YouTube and, and SoundCloud is, is a great thing. It's a huge milestone in uh, decentralized applications in cryptocurrency. You know, the idea that we're bringing cryptocurrency to the surface in a way that's changing the way that music is curated, that videos are curated is a great thing. So, um, you know, for now, the bandwidth is figured out. The, the, you know, the constraints are, are being managed. And um, I think that... Uh, you know, just like any application that you build, you have to scale it along the way. And I'm sure that these entrepreneurs uh, who I've met recently, I'm very privileged to have, to have met the guys who have done DTube and D-Sound. And, you know, I think that they'll, they'll take the steps that they need to, to, to continue to grow these things. Yeah, that, that's really interesting to hear. So, like, the guys that work for DTube and, like, D-Sound, they're not, how, how are they related to Steam? Like, are they just brand new things? They just, you know, these guys, they're great guys, but, you know, they just showed up. They just showed up within the past couple months and they said, hey, I've built this application. It works like this. And, you know, I think that, that the people in the Steam community should use it. 
And that's exactly what happened. People gravitated towards these applications because they're, they're big fans of creating videos or of creating audio and sharing that. And uh, yeah, but it's completely independent. Um, I didn't know these guys before they built the apps. They just showed up and built it. And the reason that they can do that is the blockchain is just this public open resource. Anyone can go to the blockchain, run their own node, and build apps on top of it. It's exactly what they've done. They run the Steam node, they run the IP IPFS node, they've scratched together a little creativity and poof, they've got their, their new application. One of the one of the chat the person in the chat right now is saying like he bought Steam for 30, 34,249 Satoshis. <laughs> and he says he's taking a hit. Um, do you think Steam's price at least, in, like you know, Steve's price prices is. Do you think it's fairly valued? What, what's your take on it? You know, I I really have no idea. You know, with these currencies, they they don't have any sort of valuation metric that looks like anything that we're familiar with. Uh, you know, if we're looking at equity counterparts and that sort of thing. So when I think about currencies, the way that I value them is the way that I think these cryptocurrencies are valued is that it's all about how many people are involved. How many people are involved? How many people are touching this currency? How many people care? And so I do believe that social media is a gateway to making more people care, to getting more people involved. So I believe it's a hugely valuable thing to tie into cryptocurrency, social media. So uh, I think that the, the setup we have here is great and it's on the verge of becoming bigger. It could be totally huge. Uh, it could be a behemoth across the internet. Um, but you also look at something like Bitcoin and Ethereum, and you can just see that there's 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 lots and lots of Google traffic there. And I think I think you could do a breakdown of of market cap of of cryptocurrencies versus their total Google interest, the total search traffic, and there's probably a very strong correlation there. So, you know, um, I think if you can surround a cryptocurrency with an ecosystem that is growing to support business and is constantly attracting more attention, that's a good thing. But honestly, you know, the day-to-day -day speculation, I have no idea. There's no way to predict. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you talked about value, I agree. Like, value and attention, just, you guys are, I mean, out of all the cryptocurrency projects, isn't Steemit ranked, like, it's definitely the top tier uh, project of, right, currently, right? It's, it's the best and the most groundbreaking uh, app built on a blockchain there's ever been. Um, so yeah, I would agree with you. <laughs> yeah, in terms, and I know in terms of traffic, you guys are like, you guys are definitely kicking ass. And yeah, also, we've we've surged uh, up the rankings. We're now a top twenty one hundred uh, site by Alexa rankings uh, globally. We're also a top eight hundred site in Korea. I've been so pumped to see the traffic that we've been getting from Korea. The community, the Korean community, is amazing, and um, you know, there's there's appears to be great uh, curation going on there, and just great content coming out yeah uh, but yeah but it's I think I think it's always I think it's always tough because well okay so let's 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 go on a different note let's try to go, go on a different note what are some of the biggest criticism because when I when I look for you on YouTube right the majority is uh, the biggest things I see is like a scheme of a steam a Ponzi scheme you know and that's like the biggest thing that people have. But what are some of the biggest criticism you've received about Steam or Steemit? You know, people say that about Bitcoin too. Um, and all these cryptocurrencies face a similar thing. But the reality is all sorts of things that act as currencies have the same properties. Anything you buy today to sell tomorrow has these elements of speculation involved. Um, but the reality is the purpose of cryptocurrencies is to bring everyone into this. Because honestly, when everyone finally is in, then we're looking at a new paradigm, a new financial paradigm. So the goal is to actually bring as many people uh, into these systems as possible. If people don't like that, if they haven't gotten their minds wrapped around that, you know, it's just, um, you know, it's just a matter of time for, for, for the latecomers. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, I think that, that things have gone extremely well uh, from public perception uh, standpoint. Um, you know, and I think that the community, the Steam community especially, has been a huge uh, uh, factor in that. There's lots of passionate people building in this ecosystem and staying tuned into what's going on in the ecosystem. 
and they're there to help drive change and uh, you know, see that new features are added to the blockchain and that sort of thing. So the other thing that, that people should consider about cryptocurrencies is that they're often experiments. Steam especially came into existence with no ICO. It's a real experiment to see if we could apply these new mechanics to cryptocurrencies and see if it would matter at all. And it turns out people really like the concept. Otherwise, it wouldn't have a market cap of where it is. It wouldn't have the traffic uh, that it does. Um, but it does. It started at next to nothing, and now it's big. So, um, you know, and the economics are legit, and they're like all the other cryptocurrencies. There's less than 10% uh, 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 new emissions of tokens in Steam per year. That's less than Ethereum. That's pretty much where Bitcoin was two years ago. Um, you know, it's, it's totally on par in some of those general economic senses. And it's kicking ass in ways that, that other projects aren't. Okay. Uh, Younglin, you have, it? You have questions? Um, yeah, I do have a lot of questions. Um, I think, Nad, the, one of the criticisms that you got to make is the, about the initial distribution problem. So people are criticizing uh, Steam for um, that the majority of the... Um, majority of the coins are pre-mined, sort of like pre-mined. And then uh, you change the consensus algorithm to proof of stake so that the only the one, who, the early adopters got more um, steam um, as time goes on. So I think you've got this question a lot of times, but like what's your um, response to that? My response to just a comment on it? Well, you know, there's, there's less than 50% of the total steam that will ever exist in existence today. So there's still a massive amount of distribution to happen in steam, even over the next 15 and 20 years. And it's getting distributed to new players, to all these, these people posting and blogging. And so I think that distribution is inherently something that gets addressed by steam by the proof of brain mechanics. I haven't brought that term up yet, but essentially in cryptocurrencies, that term means that there are new tokens being distributed to people who are posting content and are curating content via mechanisms uh, on the blockchain. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that that addresses a big part of the distribution thing. You know, the tokens all at the beginning were mined and they were mined, you know, by certain groups, my company mined a bunch, and now we're using it to grow the ecosystem. We're using it to build valuable products on top of the protocol. And today we hold about 30% of the tokens. And is that too much? Is that too little? If people don't like it, I don't, I don't know what to tell them. But, you know, we're using it to build out our vision. And we want the people to come into the ecosystem who also have a vision for the blockchain and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we just keep doing work. That's all we can do. Yeah, I guess um, that's fair enough. People know that how much, like, Steam that you hold, and they don't like it. I mean, they don't have to do Steam, right? They don't have to invest. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, Satoshi had 10% of Bitcoin for a long time, if not more. He mined, like, 50% over the first year. It's really the... It's really... If you go back and look at that, it's almost the same numbers. You know, these things shake out over time, just like anything. Anything that comes into existence starts out centralized, like a, you know, like a, like a, 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 a like a, a, a single cell organism, a single cell thing that ends up becoming a baby. You know, it, right. it grows into many, many cells that support it over time. That's what's happening with Steam. And that's what happened with Bitcoin. And you can look at other projects. You can say, OK, Ethereum, there's literally two guys who control more than 51% of the hash power. And in proof of work coins, you know, the 51% attack is a big deal. Um, so, you know, all these coins have things you can, you can look at and say, is this legit? Is this legit? But the good thing about proof of stake is that, um, and delegated proof of stake, is that the people who hold the stake have an interest in seeing the platform succeed. I don't have any interest in seeing the tokens become worth less. I have only an interest in seeing them worth more. So uh, I'm here to support the ecosystem and do as much as I can. And um, I don't know if people have any concerns. Um, yeah, beyond that, I mean, they can either raise them or they can uh, they, they can vote for feet. They can move on to the next project. 
Um, the another criticism they get like, a lot is that the whales have too much power. So there's a problem of collusion and censorship. Um, so is there any mechanism that you can systematically prevent this? Or yeah, there are. So so there's a couple things here. So first, I want to ask: uh, Are you aware of the the changes from a super linear rewards curve to a linear rewards curve? I've, I've heard about it, but like I don't know the details. Yeah, essentially, when when the when the platform uh, was first written into existence, there was a super linear. Uh, a rewards curve, which essentially means, um, you know, as you're voting with your stake, the more stake you have, uh, the power, the influence that you have is compounding uh, as you vote. And so, yes, there was sort of a disproportionate amount of power to people who had more. Um, that has been greatly decreased. Uh, that that disproportionate voting power doesn't really exist anymore under a linear system. Under a linear system, you only have as much power to distribute new tokens as you hold stake. And so that's much more like this the voting system you might find in a company when, you know, if a company has 100 shares and you have 30 and I have 70, when I vote, I have 70% of the vote and you have 30. You hold 30% of the shares, so you vote, you know, 30 out of the 100 shares when there's a shareholder vote. That's just fair. And that's kind of how stake-weighted uh, voting is in Steam today. Now, that's not to say. Uh, I've, I've been holding back on some other uh, experimental concepts that uh, we're playing with. One of them is the idea that you can have democratic voting in these mm -hmm. systems uh, to distribute rewards. And there would be huge value in having democratic systems because then you could have a much more effective sort of um, much more effective curation algorithms where you're really getting much more wisdom of the crowd where every day when someone starts out, any given person only has the same amount of voting power as anybody else, right? And they have the same incentives to vote more accurately and that sort of thing. And the way that that would happen, uh, the democratic voting, is essentially you need to be able to whitelist um, identities. You whitelist identities and then you say, if this is a single identity, then they have a single set of votes every 24 hours or something like that. And so you need someone to provide or several people to provide essentially feeds, data feeds of these identities into the blockchain. And then the blockchain has to use uh, that data as consensus uh, in relation to the rewards pool uh, for you know, the token. Now, I'm not particularly talking about Steam. This whole idea I've really invented for the smart media token. So it's something that we're playing with. Smart media tokens are really also an answer to any of the, uh, any of the, the rough edges that, that the Steam rewards pool might have today. You know, we know that there was no way to get the Steam rewards pool to be perfect the first time. That's why there's been 19 hard forks in Steam. Mm -hmm. Things have changed. Things have been refined over time. And now with smart media tokens, a thousand experiments can blossom. We're not confined to one experiment any longer. We can see thousands and thousands of these appear. We can see people play with them in different ways and begin to use them more efficiently and more effectively. And if people find, you know, algorithms and, 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 and you know, different ways of structuring the communities that work better, then, you know, maybe the Steam coin should be considering adopting some of those too. Um, but it's very difficult, maybe impossible, to get something to be perfect. So it's better to see many, many experiments and see which ones rise to the top as the greatest successes. Right. I think that makes sense. Um, the one of the things that I've observed in the Korean sort of a Steam community is that after you change the reward algorithm, people get less and less reward and they get kind of like dissatisfied. Um, so, I mean, you can't make the economic model perfect from the, from the start, right? So um, you've done a lot of hard work and do a lot of changes to your reward algorithm, right? So what are your uh, lessons learned so far regarding the economics of tokens? The lessons learned, I would say that um, perception of fairness is hugely important. And, um, you know, although everything is fair in an open source, uh, you know, open code, you know, environment where people show up and they use code that's, that's public, um, there are still things you need 
that that should exist for a community to feel like um you know there's an equal opportunity to get involved and so moving from super linearity to linearity is part of that and that's improved the culture in the ecosystem um but there are still challenges with that there's challenges in in doing effective curation and that sort of thing um but uh yeah you want, you you basically want to have math underlying these tokens that that helps instigate a good culture and um i think over time we've we've seen steam do that better and better and just back to smts you know we'll see even more experiments and we'll see you know these experiments help all sorts of communities and and cultures blossom yeah i just like I, I thought it was so interesting that you chose the phrase like perception of fairness as opposed to it being objectively fair. I mean, like first of all, we know we I think I, I think we can all um, agree that you can't be objectively fair. Uh, but how do you how do you balance things like so you know like nowadays there's a lot of bots on Steemit, you know that that go around doing different tasks and sometimes these bots these automated things either one i think either rub people the wrong way or two there are like the bots don't function as they're meant to meant to you know like the i think i think that people originally came up with the bots because they thought it was it was an easy way to make uh, it was a good way to make easy money but now i i feel like it's like a little bit harmful for the system what do you think about bots in steam it? I think bots can be really good, um, you know, and something that becomes too spammy can be curated out of an interface. So ultimately, we all have to remember that interfaces are the ultimate curator. And maybe we don't realize it today, but, but you know, Steemit can do more curation. And if there's really some spam garbage going on, it probably shouldn't be there, don't you think? So uh, I'm all about bots doing great th things. Bots ultimately are humans who have sort of codified their actions. Um, so these are real people, you know, in a way, um, I think that they're a good thing and ultimately they can provide valuable services on the whole. There'll be a net benefit to the steam ecosystem. Yeah. I, th I just think, I just think like, cause I've heard several complaints from different, different Korean users. And it seems like, um, one of the things is like you said, like it, that will benefit different cultures, but. I think there is definitely like a cultural divide and by cultural divide, I mean, first of all, there's just a language barrier where let's say like the bot will go through every single steam post, right? And all of steam it, but the bot is not, he'll be, he'll be able to weigh like an English post, but I've heard that several Korean users have told me that there, there will be bots who think every Korean post is a spam. And they'll go go around posting that, and then so that seems to be like a concern among some users. Yeah, dumb bots. Dumb bots are are no good. Um, yeah. So ultimately, you know, interfaces need better curation tools. I, I think we're really having a conversation about Steemit, the site, more than we're talking about Steam at this point. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, you know, a good website serves its users by giving them great user experience. Over time, you know, Steemit will incorporate, you know, lots of different, uh, you know, uh, uh, types of, 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 of talent who can basically help with machine learning and that sort of thing to make sure that a delivered uh, a user experience can, that a user experience can be delivered at high quality. And ultimately, that's going to come down to, you know, managing some of this bot activity and that sort of thing. So, you know, we're still at the early days. The website has only been live for about a year and a half. And, um, you know, there's, there's tons of things that are kind of changing in the background. We've got some new GUI stuff coming out soon. We've got a mobile app coming out soon. And ultimately, you know, we're going to be addressing these concerns because they need to, you know, the user experience needs to be improved to see this app scale to millions of users. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I was going to, that was going to be my next question. My next question was going to be about the mobile app and why you guys haven't, <laughs> why there isn't any. And what's up with, um, I mean, like so my, some of my developer friends said like, you know, Steemit uses React, but it, I don't, they don't, they kind of saw it as not using React to its like fullest extent because the user experience was pretty bad. 
yeah. That's just that's just their two cents. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So, what do you, but what do you think about like share reward pool? Like, okay. So take for example Korea. So Korea, there are there there are a lot of Koreans who have Steam Power, right? And um, when it comes to like the shared reward pool, everybody in the world is sharing the same pool, from what I understand. But if certain things are gibberish to me, then isn't it? Then doesn't that um, isn't that like less? I don't know. I don't know if fair is the word to use it. But doesn't that limit certain languages or certain? Yeah, people? I'll, I'll put it this way. I'll put it this way. So so a rewards pool is. Uh, influenced by its DNA, by the people who hold it, and, and you know the DNA of of in in uh, in the social media context, you know we we really break things down by things like language barrier and culture and that sort of thing. So ultimately, maybe there's more English speakers than Korean speakers today, you know, and maybe that dictates how the rewards pool is getting allocated. Um, it's not a huge issue today because of the linear aspect of all of this. But, you know, arguably, I suppose it's still an issue in some ways. So, you know, this is another thing that Smart Media Tokens addresses. You know, different language groups can band together to, you know, create tokens that serve their language niche, you know. And, and then they have a, a token that has a DNA that is very, you know, close to, you know, what they, what they want it to be and, and, and is shared they have a token that's shared with the people they want to share it with. Um, so, yeah, I think smart media tokens address this in a big way. Uh, Youngun, do you have any more questions? Um, yeah, I want to touch on some of the problems inherent in the social media. Um, at the end of the day, Steam is a social media runs on decentralized runs in a decentralized way, right? Um, so, but the current social media has a lot of problems. Like, I I, I can't think of three for now. The first one is fake news. The second is plagiarism. The third one is the right to be forgotten. Um, those are the problems that are uh, being sort of uh, in, in the current social media as well. But I think those kind of problems are being amplified in the blockchain space because of the crypto economic incentive. And the blockchain, uh, you can't never delete your contents, right? So I, 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 I just want to ask, like, what kind of, like, um, so defense mechanisms do you have against those kind of like attack factors? So th you said it was fake news. What were the last two? Uh, the plagiarism. So uh, they steal the contents of others and they monetize those contents. And the third one is a right to be forgotten. I mean, you write something, but you want to delete it. But like in Steam, you can't never delete your content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, let's start with that one. So the right to be forgotten. So the right to be forgotten is a state-granted right. You know, certain countries, uh, I know in Europe, they have this. Um, an interface can always forget you. The blockchain cannot. And there's no one you can go to with the blockchain to tell them to erase it. But at the same time, you know, when Google is doing its searches on content, it's not searching the blockchain. It's searching the websites searching the interfaces. So if the interfaces remove the content about you, then you're essentially forgotten. And so it supports that pillar uh, uh, or, or that it, it, it basically combats that issue. You know, we have, to, we have to learn to understand the difference between content on the blockchain and content at the interface levels. Um, it's very, right, but very like important. If, for, if, yeah, if something bad is uh, about you is recorded on blockchain. Anybody can retrieve that in information and then display it publicly. Yeah, they can. And they can also go and search public records, you know, at your local municipality court and pull those records and then call up all your neighbors and tell them about it individually. You know, those records are still there, right? Right. So what, what we've essentially done with the blockchain is we've just, yeah, I mean, maybe the content is more accessible, but you're still complying with the right to be forgotten, I would argue. Okay. I don't know if, if you agree, but, um, you know, essentially, I think, I think um, you know, that's, that's all we can do. That's, that's really the world. What I'm trying to say is that's the world we already live in. 
that that information is probably accessible somewhere, right? Um, right. It's just hidden. So if it's on the blockchain and hidden, or if it's in your local municipality court and hidden, it's there, but it's hidden. But yeah, it's, but in the blockchain, it's, not, it's on the public blockchain, so it's like publicly available all the time. So I mean, it's really easy to search, right? So I, I would argue it amplifies the problem of the right to be forgotten. So I mean, if if that's a, I mean, if that's something that's gonna happen anyway, like I don't know. Well, well, may, well. I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's an answer here, but maybe the right to be forgotten isn't. Um, well, first of all, I think I think it's satisfied, and then second, the 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 idea that that uh, you know the information is more accessible. Maybe that's a good thing, you know. Maybe the right to be forgotten isn't that important. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Just, uh, let me take... jump on to your next one here. So plagiarism, yeah. plagiarism. So um, yeah, so. With blockchain, you can timestamp just about anything. With the Steam blockchain that supports, uh, you know, uh, plain text data and then timestamp timestamps it. It's very easy to use the blockchain to help support your claims that you were the first to create something, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to do copyright, if you want to enforce your copyrights or something like that, or if you want to get copyright on something, you can use the blockchain to prove to governments that you did something first, you did something before somebody else. So you have provenance, it's, it's, a, it's a great provider of, of, of provenance. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great, it's great for, for combating uh, plagiarism, I would say. Okay. And nice. the other issue was fake news. I'm not sure that blockchains really solve the fake news problem. Um, you know, blockchains, they, it's like any other database. It's garbage in, garbage out. You know, it's about what humans are putting through these machines uh, uh, that, that, that causes the end results, that causes fake news. It's about humans. That's a human problem, not a problem that I think any sort of database can really solve. Okay. Wow. You got more? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's that's uh wow. Yeah, it's really it's that's really insightful. Like just some of the some of the examples that you gave us were like was pretty refreshing. Um especially because I think I, I I would like there to be actually be more people in the blockchain space who are instead of using tr instead of using Twitter to write essays who are um actively um thinking about like social media, because social media is just the state of the internet, right? So how blockchains will mesh together with social media, but like there's not, I don't, yeah, there's not that many people. Um, who do you view as some of your competitors right now? Competitors? I don't know. I, I don't know if I can really say that there are any. There have been lots of projects pop up that say they're doing blockchain and social media. I usually go and then I analyze the project and I identify key weaknesses or why it won't scale or why, you know, the cryptocurrency isn't that, that interesting. Like, for instance, a lot of projects come to me and they're like, yeah, we're issuing an ERC-20 and it's going to integrate with our website. I'm like, okay, how does your token issuance model work? And it turns out it's a completely centralized issuance model where basically they issue themselves a bunch of tokens and then they reissue them to people uh, who post on their site. And so there's no decentralization of the issuance. There's no way for other apps to plug into this and take advantage of those issuance mechanisms. It's just not that. And ultimately, I think that the public won't find them that interesting either. Um, there are others that are still focusing on tipping as, as a thing rather than using these sort of blockchain subsidies, these, these proof of brain mechanics. And, you know, I think we've seen tipping experiments for the last 20 years and, and none of them have have really changed the landscape. Some of them work in niche ways and cre can create nice niche businesses for entrepreneurs, but ultimately I don't think we're gonna change the landscape of the web by focusing on tipping. We need to focus on mechanisms that help us uh, basically erase the frictions of interaction. And that's what Steam is all about. You have token issuance that's decentralized and seamless. You have tokens that just fly into people's wallets just for taking basic social media actions that they were 
going to do anyway on Twitter or Facebook or something like that. So are there competitors? I think there are people that want to be in this space, but I think that it's very hard to to tackle all of the issues and, and understand how to apply all the nuances and, and to even know what all the problems are. Uh, so it takes huge amounts of, of attention and experience and luck and um, a willingness to, you know, be solving, you know, lots and lots of problems, not just one or two. Um, and so, you know, the good thing is we've done a lot of this with steam and, We've come so far uh, that I've basically said, okay, we actually do need some competition in this space because our goal is to tokenize the internet. And we can't do that with one token, with just one set of incentives, with just one set of DNA. So we need smart media tokens. We need a new token protocol on Steam that's kind of like the ERC20 protocol, but with uh, better usability and potential UX at the uh, application layer. Um, you know, from speed and scale and uh, from proof of brain mechanics. And uh, we need to be able to give these tokens to other websites so that they can compete with us. But it's sort of like a complementary competition where everything's happening on the same blockchain. SMTs provide value to Steam. Steam provides value to SMTs. And it's a very symbiotic relationship. Um, but ultimately, I want competition. I want to see competition. I want to see the internet tokenized and I'm now working my hardest to make sure that happens. Yeah. I, I remember the first time I, I saw, I read anything on Steam is um, August of last year. And I remember, I remember the Steam white paper from August. And it was, and I read it, I read the white paper again yesterday. And these were completely separate white papers where I, re the only thing I remember from August is the crab analogy. And then now you had all these economic attack vectors listed. And basically, as far as I could see, you're telling, you're defending on why these economic attack vectors um, are not viable. But uh, so do you think personally that to make a long-term blockchain project, especially one that deals with tokens successful, that the most important thing is how the, me the mechanisms behind the token economy? I think the mechanisms behind the token economy are very important for driving the, um, the most ideal behaviors, which is to spread the currency into as many hands as possible and get the currency to be valuable. Um, so I do think that's important. And now the thing about that white paper that I think you're mentioning, I got to just mention, it's mostly the same. It's, it's pretty much been the same since the beginning. It was updated to update some of the economics. Uh, and to talk about like linear rewards curve versus super linear, we did put out a blue paper, which is a short condensed version uh, of that in a way. I think it's a better white paper, really. It's more succinct, uh, just talks about, you know, the meat and, and the bones of, of what Steam's about. And then, of course, we put out the smart media tokens white paper just recently, too. And I think that goes into the importance of the mechanics of tokens uh, quite deeply and it actually explains some of the nuances of, of Steam itself in a lot of ways. Okay. So how did the, okay, let's go into the SMTs because I, I think we're all dying to hear about it. Yeah. Um, I, I heard somewhere that it came about as a result of the token summit. Is that true? Or how did the idea come uh, about? Uh, well, you know, I, I sort of hinted at it at the token summit. It was an idea that was boiling up inside me for a long time. And I couldn't stand that I hadn't basically shouted it on top of a mountain yet. And, you know, we had a stage there. I was there with some guys who I respect a whole hell of a lot who are kind of in the same space, you know, the social media and token space. Um, and, yeah, so that was the first time I mentioned it publicly. Um, but it had been sort of stewing inside me. It was one of those things where you've been working on a project long enough. And I had been considering the idea of smart media tokens in, in different ways, um, you know, for probably the year prior. But it was kind of that moment in time where several ideas had come together and we knew it was time to do this. And so I announced it there and we, we basically uh, immediately after that started writing the white paper, putting the, the plans on paper, and um, it came out really well. We've integrated all the best concepts from Ethereum and from other blockchain uh, experiments and we've done it in a way that I think is, is going to be 
uh, advantageous to Steam in the long run, where Steam basically gets to say that it's an application-specific blockchain, competing with these open programmability application general blockchains like Ethereum and Tezos. And you know, ultimately, the application-specific blockchain can now compete for several reasons. One is, you know, when you have a token protocol on top of another blockchain, if the native coin, if the native token has proof of brain mechanics, it is better aligned with meta tokens that also have proof of brain mechanics. So there's a, a very symbiotic uh, relationship created on Steam um, with its its token protocol, smart media tokens. Whereas with Ethereum and ERC twenties, there's a very uh, independent relationship between the both, where they don't really uh, they're not really that closely tied together. The ERC twenty doesn't really stand to get that much benefit other than the potential for you know a big ICO you know from Ethereum. So um, that's one of the things, you know, Steam also supports high scalability. Um, it's also able to scale specifically for the smart media token protocol where any application general protocol, no matter if they're using bandwidth rate limiting or transaction fees, is going to have a very tough time uh, basically designing the cost algorithms around the desired user behaviors the you know the social in our case we get to design around these social media behaviors whereas any other blockchain is going to have you know an open programmability application general blockchain is going to have an infinite number of things that they have to tune their 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 pricing system to their cost system to and uh you know i think that's really an insurmountable challenge in the long run i think today it works uh, today these are all new concepts but i'm trying to look five and ten years out and I'm saying ultimately for us to be as big and as successful as possible, we need to be doing this in a niche-focused way with an application-specific blockchain. So, you know, all these ideas have been culminating since the very beginning. When I started this project last year, the very first thing I wanted to do was build a comments widget. And I wanted to build a comments widget that was a lot like Discuss that would allow us to take a token like Steam to existing publishers and get it integrated just below their blogs, and we'd monetize all the comments and all that sort of thing. But we realized quickly that the, the incentives alone in Steam were not enough to make that happen. The publishers who have existing businesses already, they need a little bit more incentive to get these things done, right? And so Smart Media Tokens was my beginning of, of an answer to that. You know, I was thinking, how can I get Reddit to integrate this? How can I get a, other, other sites to integrate this? Smart Media Tokens are the answer to that. They are a way to create... A, a new incentive system for this business to take advantage of fully. And, you know, so, so think you can see that things were just percolating and culminating, you know, other ideas were coming out on Ethereum and, and we've adopted all the best ones that have come out and it all got merged into this idea of smart media tokens. We have an absolute crack team of brilliant minds here at Steemit and uh, we all just put our heads together and, and, and boiled out the, the smart media tokens paper and, you know, um, so yeah, it's a long time coming. First announced at Token Summit, and I think that the concept is is you know has the potential to be huge. Yeah, I think the um concept are really interesting. Um, but how does it look like for a social media to adopt the SMT? So for example, suppose I'm a Reddit, right? I I run a Reddit. How can I sort of uh, um, incorporate the SMT to um current existing? Social so media. what we need to do with Reddit, and, and, and this is something that's probably a long shot, you know, but, but what would hypothetically happen is you take a subreddit, I think would be the easiest way to start, and you just link the subreddits, you know, you, you just link it up to the blockchain's APIs so they can make calls and, and do transactions and that sort of thing. Um, or you'd have another layer sort of in between the subreddit and the blockchain that's, that's kind of facilitating everything. But essentially, you know, there needs to be some movement on Reddit's side to make all those connections happen. So the way that's actually going to be easier to get existing websites doing all this stuff and, and launching tokens and using tokens uh, uh, to grow their user base or raise money or monetize is, uh, is ultimately the comments widget. And so I'm building that now. And it's going to be as easy as, hey, do you run a blog? Okay, swap out your old comments widget for this new comments widget. And now all your users can sign up through this thing and they can post and vote through this thing and they can earn cryptocurrency through this thing just for commenting. And then you can even link the, the original post to it as well. So you can be earning as you post. Uh, you can set it to take a percentage of the rewards that are flowing through on your widget. So you're, 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 you're monetizing all the transactional voting and, 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 and stake-weighted 
uh, movement that's going on there. Um, and you can also launch your token right through that interface too. And the reason it's able to work so well is it's leveraging existing tools. It's leveraging Steam Connect to do all the transaction signing. So you as the person running the blog, you don't need to uh, focus on all the complex cryptography or any, any of the hard issues. It's all been solved. Um, and yeah, so, so everything, you know, it, that's going to be the, the turnkey solution. And for all the people calling themselves blockchain consultants out there, this is going to be the ultimate solution because now they can go to real clients and say, hey, I have a real solution for you. I'm not just going to talk to you for three hours and charge you $1,000. I'm going to give you something you can integrate with your website today and you will be touching blockchain. You'll be touching cryptocurrency. Let's make it happen. You know, it's going to be as simple as that. So, you know, I think for Reddit, it's a bit more of a challenge, but ultimately those integrations could be hugely valuable. So I'm pursuing those too. And so are a lot of other people that, that are, you know, kind of close to the project too. So, you know, ultimately we're going to see cool integrations like that that are direct between behemoth sites and the Steam blockchain. But we're also going to make it super easy with tools like the Comments widget. Okay. Oh, so you talked about the Comments budget. Like, can you elaborate more on Comments budget and how it works? So is it more like I issue my tokens and then kind of like swap it with the underlying tokens and use that as a Comments budget? to support my sort of, uh, network? Yeah, so, so if anyone's familiar with the Discuss comments widget, it's going to look a lot like that. And you know, there's uh, lots of other comments widgets out there too, and any blogger can swap one for another. It's, it's really easy to do. You know, it's a line of JavaScript here or there, or it's a WordPress, you know, it's a widget download. So um, the way that the currency will work is essentially you have like a, a user's manual, you have the, the owner's manual, and you, you pop open the, the settings page, and then you can basically press a, you know, you can fill in a, a few parameters and choose what your token is going to, uh, choose what economics are going to apply to your token, and you hit go. And then there's a token running there, and, and basically the rule set will be if anyone is commenting uh, through your site, they're essentially creating comments that have the potential to activate your token. So they're, you know, participating in the rewards pool of your token. If they're voting through your site, they're participating in the rewards pool of your token. Um, and then also all your comments and your posts are going to be tagged with Steam as well, too. So you running the comments widget, you can, if you're the person running the blog, you can take all the Steam that runs through your comments widget. You don't even have to show your users. Um, so that's another way that you can monetize or you can, you can let the Steam run back into your users' wallets. Uh, you're going to have all of these, um, all of these settings available to you uh, mm -hmm. in the comments widget in the long, you know, over the long run. I, I don't know that the alpha concept version of an app would ha would have all these things available, but over time, I can imagine all of these features becoming available to the people running blogs, so that they can have the most effective. Uh, a token possible so they can bootstrap a little currency so they have a token that's exciting their users so you know their token is is effective um and doesn't have you know any sort of failed economics or anything like that in the in the white paper you present like five different use cases right which one do you personally think will be like the first that people adopt i i don't mean to be a dead horse but i think the comments widget um, I think the comments widget is a way to prove this concept far and wide and get people pushing this thing in a viral way because anyone can then take the comments widget that's open source and turn it into a business for themselves, whether they're consulting and getting integrations to happen or consulting, getting integrations and happening and then also consulting on ICOs or, or, or running one themselves. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's going to be able to touch so many people so quickly. Um, but I think all those use cases are extremely viable and extremely important. You know, we will see websites connect directly to the blockchain as well and use the tokens in, in ways that, um, you know, are specifically unique to their site. Um, you know, one of the fifth, the fifth use case was talking about the idea of decentralized exchange. We will see tokens appear to represent other real, you know, other currencies in the world, whether they're their gold or the U.S. dollar or something like that, and then people will run more gateways, allowing more capital to flow into the ecosystem. 
and you know that's hugely valuable um and then yeah hopefully we'll see you know sort of subreddit use cases as well you know with steam it we're working on communities now at the interface level over time we will figure out how to do uh you know how to basically allow moderators of these communities on steam it to launch tokens maybe they can't do icos but they can do um, proof of brain tokens that they get distributed wholly by voting or something like that or maybe they can do ICOs we just have to figure that out so um, you know ultimately what SMTs do is they just open up they, they take the the roof off the off the house and just open it up for complete creativity and we're gonna see so many things but um, yeah I, I hope that every entrepreneur out there can kind of pick one thing and and run with it because you know I think I think you know especially if they're early to it they can have a lot of success. Speaking of moderators, um, I'm just reminded of you know like the whole debacle right now that's happening in uh, our Bitcoin and our BTC. You know the whole censorship thing in your decentralized social media, like what you said, like these communities, these niche communities with moderators. What are the roles of these moderators? Will they do they get the power to censor, or when when you say moderator, how far is that scope? So basically, how are Steam Mits moderators going to be the same or different from Reddit moderators? Sure, uh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, um, it's still so early for us. We haven't played with any of this ourselves. We haven't released any aspect of it ourselves. We'll roll it out in batches. Um, to make sure that we're doing it in a way that's very constructive. Um, and so I can't commit to anything there, but, you know, we're just going to learn from, you know, learn from existing communities. We've learned a ton from Reddit. We've taken a ton from Reddit. And, you know, um, you know we'll end up doing things a bit differently and hopefully, um, hopefully in a better way. Yeah, how in the, how in the world did you design all the economic models for your smart media tokens. Yeah, so smart media tokens uh, take a lot of lessons from Steam itself. And, you know, we basically, everything that's ever happened on Steam, we've offered through smart media tokens with a few exceptions. There are a few um, economic things that, um, that are different, like the automated market maker is totally new. And essentially, that's this, this trading bot that operates completely autonomously on the blockchain to provide liquidity between an SMT and Steam and potentially an SMT and another SMT. And, uh, you know, we took lessons there from some, some projects on Ethereum and that sort of thing. And now we've implemented them and, you know, through smart media tokens will be implemented in a hard coded way um, with some slightly different economics that we think, you know, uh, uh, may be an improvement. Um, but yeah, basically our lessons have come from our own experience, from our experience watching Ethereum, and you know, basically, you know, also good discussion with with a, our our huge community of of brilliant entrepreneurs and developers, you know, who have contributed tons of time and ideas, and um, you know, a lot of that in a lot of ways has been absorbed into uh, the ideas into the smart media token concept as well. So it's an amalgamation of all the best stuff, of all our hours of, of hard work and, you know, lots of brilliant uh, ideas that have, um, you know, have risen to the top in the space. Yeah, I, I, I just think it's so cool that um, I think you, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, weren't you hinting at like kind of like interchain cooperation, especially when it comes to SMTs? Because... I see, I, see, I see something there with like Civic is definitely like someone that you would cooperate with. Bancor, I don't know how much you would. Is that, a, is that something in the future? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so the Bancor guys, I've been meaning to talk to Guy and uh, he and I have been trying to set something up. Uh, so yeah, I think there's, yeah, there could be something there. And with someone like Civic, I definitely had them, them in mind. Uh, you know, as we were talking about earlier, we were talking about democratic uh, rewards pools where basically everyone who's voting has a certain amount of votes per day. Each vote has a certain weight and you know, it's all about single person, single amount of votes. Right. And the way you do that is you need identity feeds. And that's very, I think similar to what civic is doing. And civic is you know, a, an identity solution. If they can provide identity feeds, then they can become part of this 
they can provide data that helps, um, you know, the consensus of the token distribution and do it in a way that, that creates totally, do ni- totally new dynamics, really changes the game for token rewards. Um, I would love to see a partnership out there. Um, but the, yeah, there's still a lot of work to be done there. And I haven't been talking to anyone on that team yet, but I have seen that project from afar and it seems like a great project. Yep. What, what was the reason for, um, like, I know you have like automated market making is part of, part of SMT, the decentralized ex- exchanges, the DEXs, the ICO, crypto asset issuance and the distribution system. What, what was the reasoning behind you, why you wanted this to be baked into SMTs as opposed to like outsourcing it maybe? Yeah, so, so when we're designing SMTs, we're thinking about, okay, how can we make sure that, that Steam the ecosystem captures a ton of value. And so we walked through different things. And also we were thinking from another perspective of how can we provide the best, cons- the best experience for users and what do users desire is what we kept asking ourselves. And one of those things was liquidity. Users desire liquidity. If they get involved in a token community, they want to know that they have a way of moving in and out and that the whole market won't dry up while they're sleeping. And so automated, automated market makers were an answer to that in a lot of respects. But automated market makers, it turns out, also have the potential to drive the economic proposition of Steam. Because if people are doing ICOs and then locking up 10 to 20 percent of the totals of the of the uh, uh, the proceeds of the ICO into an automated market maker, that's locking up Steam supply. It's taking Steam supply out of the possibility of, of, of selling. So supply is going down. Demand is either staying staying constant or increasing. So you know the effect of, of that sort of thing is that the price would go up. So you know we thought that that could be a good thing for Steam value. Uh, we felt that liquidity could be a good thing for all the people participating in SMTs. You know, and and, and overall that would be a great thing. But you know that kind of leads me to the you know to to our whole overall thinking of the value. We basically saw uh, SMTs as a five point value proposition to Steam. One, it allows Steam to act as a better bandwidth calculation token. So Steam is essentially used more like the way that that Ethereum is used as gas for smart contracts. Steam is used as a sort of gas for operating inside SMT communities and to participate maximally, to attain the maximum profits that one can across SMT communities, they will need to hold more Steam. So as a bandwidth calculation token, something that's required to transact across other communities, you know, Steam, Steam would see uh, uh, increase in demand from, from uh, the increased demand for SMTs. So, um, yeah, so this bandwidth calculation token, we went over the automated market maker. Um, you know, the idea of ICOs is also something that can bring value. ICOs attract new capital into these blockchain ecosystems. So, uh, you know, if we can see some big ICOs happen, that will potentially bring a lot of capital in through Steam into these new uh, tokens, and that can be a good thing for Steam. Uh, we also came up with the idea of influence sharing, so that uh, multiple token, ho- multiple groups of token holders can control the rewards pool of a token. This would basically allow an organization, take for instance the New York Times, to point to, let's say the Washington Post has a token, and that one's very successful with lots of the users. The New York Times can say, okay, well I want the New York Times token holders to control the distributions for the first year of the New York Times token. And the reason they would, they would do that is that would help them basically attract a target audience. They can bring over a community into their community. But something like that, if someone points to Steam and says, I want Steam to help bootstrap this, well, ultimately, you know, that gives, that confers more voting rights to Steam uh, and, you know, arguably gives it more utility gives Steam more utility, and then arguably that is increasing demand. Uh, and then the last point about value that's really important is the idea that these tokens, um, you know, they, they essentially underlie the future of the world's advertising networks. So the way that happens, the way, the way you know, that's supported is that as these tokens get integrated into websites and they have these rewards pools, the rewards pools need to be represented in interfaces. Um, through sorts of, uh, you might call them trending algorithms like we have on Steemit. And what that means is that, that posts are sorted by their pending payout. Uh, uh, and so, so you know, it's, it's sorted by how much of the rewards pool are they each going to get. And, and once that exists, once there's a sort order 
ranked from, from highest pending payout to lowest, then anyone can look at that algorithm and say, well, it only costs me $100 to get to the front page. And I know, for instance, if I get to the front page, that I will get lots of attention because lots of people look at the front page. So now I need to make a decision. Should I buy or rent Steam to push my content to the top of the front page so people will look at my posts so that I, that will potentially convert into sales of my product or more notoriety or more reputation or something like that. You know, so people are, are, are constantly making uh, um, you know, value-driven decisions about should they buy or rent Steam. And, and that sort of flow, or, or SMTs for that matter, and that sort of flow is very analogous to some of the flows we see with something like Facebook, where advertisers buy advertising space, and then those dollars go to the Facebook company. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of very sustainable uh, uh, flow of capital that goes through, through Facebook. And in a lot of ways, you know, what we're talking about describing here for Steam is very sustainable. And it's, it's really the first time we've, we've seen anything like this in the cryptocurrency space. Um, and it also is markedly different from what Facebook does because it happens in a layer where there really is no company. Uh, it's, it's, an adver it's a decentralized advertising network, really. But ultimately, yeah, those five la value flows were, were things we were talking about a lot as we were writing the paper. And as I was talking to people outside of the organization about it, they were very interested in that. So I made sure to include that in the paper, too. So, um, yeah, that's, that's yeah. kind of it. I think, there's the, I think SMTs provide a lot of value to Steam and also have their own sustainable value flows. Yeah, I, yeah, it's it's cool. It's cool that I like when I read that last part. I'm 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 really glad that you clarified it for me. When I read the final part, I was kind of like, "What is he talking about when he says like Steam is the world's advertisement network?" You know, and but now it, it's it, it, you made it clear. It's, it's you're basically paying to get in front of the line. Um, isn't that yeah? And and, and, then, no. and then the value oh. goes to the whole currency. You know, it doesn't go yeah. to any company. It's it's you're buying a currency. From, you know, from the whole organization of people that are already part of the currency ecosystem. So it, it, it operates in a decentralized way. The, the value increase happens in a decentralized way. So, um, yeah, maybe we should call it, you know, Steam, the world's decentralized advertising network. Yeah, it's just, it's just different. It's just cool because, you know, I, another thing, I'm, I, I'm interested in anything that's like social media advertisement, and, you know, basic, you know, the whole thing of like the Brave browser and the basic attention tokens, their whole thing is we'll make it so that you can sell basically your user data so that advertisers can benefit from this. But for you, it seems, it seems different because anyone like, so let's say, for example, like anyone that comes to a particular website, they're already interested in that data. They're, they're part of that community or that niche, right? So you've separated, like, like a Facebook ad is different because they'll mine all your data and then they'll basically put up a certain price for that data. But in your case, it seems like you separated the space, like, which is like the orders, the, the um, ordering, sorting people by their pending payout, like the front page, and you separated that from data targeting, which is you're already assuming that people will come, come on that page because they're interested. Right. And then we'll start to see this happen in more and more niche communities, you know. So as we, we do community sections on Steemit, as other websites pop up to support specific niche content, you know, then people, advertisers, bloggers, whoever, will be able to make these decisions in more niche ways and be able to have all sorts of different uh, cost equations running in their head or, you know, we'll have some sort of you know, uh, uh, spreadsheets to, to, to help them make these decisions. Um, and ultimately, I think that will drive even more uh, purchase uh, and renting of Steam to, to, to get more attention. Um, so I think the proliferation of interfaces, of niche areas of websites like communities on Steam, it ultimately will be a driver of demand too. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I have... Oh, go ahead. Just one question about the um, automated market making. You said, um, so I just want to clarify. Um, so when I'm doing the ICO, should I reserve some of the um, crowdfunded amount in reserve for the automated market, market making? Is that mandatory? It's not mandatory. You could do it at 0% 
zero, the ratio could be zero. So it means you don't have to take any of the ICO and put it in there. Uh, automated market makers can also be created at any time. So you could reserve some to put in there later. Um, it might be one of the, what, what, we, what we imagine is it's one of those things that as you're doing an ICO, you may want to uh, offer that as part of the ICO to the community. Because it may turn out that the community, that the people buying the ICO are interested in the idea that there will be a market maker. And if they're interested in that, it may be in the ICO creator's interest to facilitate an automated market maker. So it's, it's meant to be a thing that's mutually beneficial. Um, so if you think that the automated market maker would be beneficial to your community and your potential community members think it would be beneficial too, then it, there's a great reason to do it. You know, and it doesn't, it's not something, you know, it's, it's, it's something with, um, you know, the, 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 there's a range uh, that, that you would choose from in making that decision. You know, you're choosing between 0% ratio and 100% ratio. At 100%, you're really talking about a pegged token. You're talking about a token completely pegged to another asset like Steam, right? So at 0%, you're talking about a very independent asset. So you may want there to be some sort of symbiosis between uh, the SMT and and steam to you know kind of work with each other so maybe that's at one percent maybe it's at five percent maybe it's at ten percent i don't know i think that we'll see a lot of experiments around that right yeah um, i got oh go ahead uh, no 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 you go. all right you know when you said okay. when you said icos are a part of smt that kind of made me wearisome about Regulatory issues, especially like depending on the region, what what's going to happen with that? Well, no one has to do an ICO, you know, and you can also bring these tokens into existence solely through proof of brain, solely through voting, thoroughly, solely through interaction at the social media layers. So there never has to be ICOs to create tokens, and you can still create valuable communities from that. Uh, and that may be a solution for a lot of the people. Um, you know, when ICOs do happen, I actually just put out a post on Steemit today, steemit.com slash at net, if you want to find my blog, basically addressing this. And, you know, it's ultimately up to whoever's creating the token to decide uh, how they're going to bring it into existence if they decide to do an ICO. My advice to them is to make sure that they're, they're paying attention to the regulations in their jurisdiction, that they're talking to their lawyers, that they're doing things in ways where there won't be any issues. Um, now, there may be a case that, you know, an ICO of Steam is, is truly a saleable product because as soon as it's issued, it's able to have real tangible use. It's not like an ERC-20 token that comes into existence and then just sits there forever and does nothing. A smart media token comes into existence and immediately starts bootstrapping community, starts you know being moved around in all sorts of ways. It's a very tangible thing that's getting used by lots of people. So... There may be some differences here from, from ICO tokens we've seen in the past, um, but ultimately it's up to the entrepreneur to explore these issues and then to make uh, informed decisions about how they're going to use these tokens. As for Steemit, Steemit's looking at these things, and we're not necessarily going to open up our own interfaces to ICOs, but remember the blockchain is public. So people come forward and they may you know, do an ICO through their own interface or something like that, and just like we've seen on Ethereum multiple interfaces have popped up to support these things in different ways. That's what I expect we'll see with Steam. Um, Steam, it won't serve every need. We won't be a shop for ICOs very likely unless regulation somehow clears the way for that. Um, you know, it's important to pay attention to the issues, but at the same time, it's okay to write software that, uh, you know, is available to the general public. Uh, just like Ethereum has done. It's a totally open platform, but, you know, Rules and regulations are respected jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And it's the same case here. Entrepreneurs should respect, um, you know, the, the laws and regulations that they need to respect. How would you, you mentioned um, Ethereum and how they have different interfaces popping up. How would you, how would Steam try to get traction when it comes to development ecosystems or interfaces? Well, smart media tokens, you know, smart media tokens incentivize people to create new applications that can create businesses right around them. You know, we're lucky that we've already seen like some serious applications pop up, you know, not just DTube, DSound, Busy, ChainBB, eSteam, and these, these applications where you can post and vote, but we've seen more than 150 applications pop up to do uh, block explorers and different statistics tools. 
you know, so there's tons of entrepreneurs here. I think it's pretty underrated. Check out steamtools.com to see some of the stuff going on. Um, and, you know, with SMTs, we're only going to see more of that because now the developers can harness their own incentives and can have more, uh, can, 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 you know, catch the windfall of all their hard work. So um, my goal here is to see more organizations pop up, more organizations pop up and become capitalized on top of Steam because ultimately that's a metric of decentralization. The more real businesses you have working on a protocol or above a protocol or side by side to a protocol, the better because it means there's more people around, there's more transactions going through, and there's more people there who care and who are talented and can work on the you know the issues. Um, so SMTs, I think, attract developers, and they also solve problems by making Steam more anti-fragile by bringing more organizations to the ecosystem uh, and making them capitalized. Yeah, a side effect of of possibly of SMTs that you mentioned in the paper is like. What, how it'll probably affect Steam dollars? Is this, is this something that we should be wary of in the foreseeable future? Um, oh, I didn't talk about Steam dollars too much. Oh, are you talking about the original white paper or the SMT paper? Oh, the SMT paper. So like, let me just quote. You said, Steam blockchain dollars are an experimental asset on Steam that relate to the US dollar originating with Steam's launch in 2016. It is unclear if SBD will bring value to holders of USD as they will compete possibly poorly with USD IOU tokens. However, SPDs will bring value to the speculators. This is in the decentralized exchange section. The reason it's written that way is because, you know, ultimately I want to encourage the idea that there will be entrepreneurs launching tokens that represent, you know, other currencies. So just like we've seen Tether. Tether uh, is a token that represents the real, that the US dollar, and it's also a gateway. The important aspect of these tokens is that they're integrated with gateways. And with tokens that are pegged by an organization, it's easier to create a gateway business. With decentralized pegged tokens like the Steam blockchain dollar and the BitUSD, they seem like great tools, but there's no gateway. There's nothing bringing new capital into the ecosystem. So ultimately, my belief is that the, the peg tokens that will do better are the peg tokens that are also operating inside a gateway business because you know the gateway business will be attracting more people to it. Um, so that's the reason it's written that way, and I hope that we see lots of peg tokens um, you know, as, as uh, the token protocol comes into existence. Yeah, that, wow, well, that's really interesting. It's just a, that, that'll unleash like brand new business. There will be people that will only be doing gateway um, business models. Okay. Wow. All right. Are you, is How are we doing on time? <laughs> is your phone almost out of battery? Yeah, it's down to 7% and it was at 15% maybe a couple minutes ago. So it's flying down now. Okay. Youngun, how are you with questions? Um, yeah, I think I'm fine. But like, I want to ask just like a few technical questions. Like, I've heard that you mentioned that the, um, in, in the YouTube interview i guess that the um your every content maybe it's a dumb question maybe every content is stored in the steam blockchain right so how how does that work basically yeah so basically the blockchain just makes uh room for these posts and it does it in a non-consensus way so so the the data is going through in, mm -hmm. in these blocks in the form of plain text and then it's um it's not consensus so it doesn't need to be sort of kept in the nodes and be exactly the same across all nodes that may not be full nodes and that sort of thing. Um, but it does have to be uh, made available inside witness nodes. And mm -hmm. what that ultimately means is that there's a redundancy of plain text content stored by many, many uh, 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 actors across the world. And... It, that then allows the blockchain to, um, you know, support censorship-resistant content for many, many websites. The websites are using the blockchain as their, their API. They're pulling the content from the blockchain, and they know it's always going to be there. Um, but, yeah, it's basically the first blockchain to make room for, uh, for data like this uh, in the form of plain text. 
So you have a witness node that stores the um, content data. Yeah, so the witness nodes are, are storing it, so all the witnesses are storing it, and then people running social media businesses are probably running full nodes also. So Steemit runs several of these full nodes. They're not witness nodes, so they're not producing blocks, but they're full nodes, and they're, they're basically propagating all of the extra data, like posts and comments as well. Wow. How many full nodes do you have currently? How many, what was that? How many full nodes do you have? Your, uh, now, you know, on now. a given day, we could be running, you know, we run several publicly, maybe four or five uh, yeah. that we make available that, that, that people can ping and get data from. And then ourselves, we're running maybe another four to six on a given day and sometimes more. But we can string up more uh, fairly easily. So there are approximately about more than 10 nodes that stores all the content data. No, no, no. And then you have, you have all the witness notes. And so there's, you know, 50 plus, uh, you know, active elevated witness nodes. Uh, maybe it's 100 now. I don't know. And so they're all running it too, and they're all independent actors as well. Okay, interesting. Um, and the, I want to talk about the Dan Larry Murphy, just like briefly. Like he invented the delegated proof of stake, kind of. And then you are still using the deep pass, right? And then he left Steam. So do you not see the problem with the like, further development of the DPoS algorithm? Um, DPoS is something that's been um, tooled around with for a while now on lots of different projects. And actually, there's, there's probably more than I can count on just one hand uh, uh, you know, out there now. So there's Tezos, there's Steam, there's BitShares, there's Lisk, uh, Arc, I think, or maybe it was Ardor. Um, you know, all these protocols are using DPoS, and there are variances uh, between one DPoS to another. Not all DPoSs are made equal. Um, the brain power we have on the team here um, is incredibly high. Our familiarity with the consensus algorithm is incredibly high, and we could potentially, you know, make proposals to the community to do tweaks on it, but ultimately, you know, the algorithm has been working extremely well. And I would only propose that we continue to use it uh, the same way today until, you know, until there's an issue. Okay. How many, how many, um, like, kind of core developers do you have that are working on the core part of it? Yeah, so we have, we have, well, Steemit Inc., the company, and this is, you know, outside of third-party developers, of which there's probably twice or three times as many. We've got about 30 people active right now on the team, of which 23 are developers. Um, of that majority are front-end and back-end developers on uh, steemit.com and mobile. Um, and then um, eight are blockchain developers contributing, to, contributing code to the Steam blockchain. Uh, so these are guys working on scalability and working on smart media tokens uh, for the most part right now. Eight seems quite like quite a large number for a blockchain company. Particularly, yeah, it's it's a good group, and you know the 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 threshold for talent is very high. You have to bring in guys with lots of uh, C plus plus experience and good math backgrounds and that sort of thing. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's it's we've been very fortunate in uh, being able to call the talent that that we have um, today. Okay. Yep. I guess I'm not you're running out of the battery, so we need to kind of wrap it up, probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask about decentralized social media and the future of it, but it's okay. I'll 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 stop for now. <laughs> we'll save save that for for next time, guys. Yeah, or we'll come, we'll come to Steam Fest or something. <laughs> yeah. Are there for so just last last thing? Are there any future plans or important dates people should be looking out for? Yeah, you know, when uh, Steam Fest is coming up November 1st through 5th, 1st through 5th it's getting late here, sorry. Um, and I think people should tune in to the two days of the conference. I think it's the 2nd and 3rd. Might have to double check that. But tune in, there's going to be a live stream or make it there in person. Um, and you should see some, some cool stuff coming out by then. How can people get in contact with you? Uh, on steamit.chat, my handle is Ned. You can ping me. All right. Well, Ned, um, thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show, and thanks for that great, like, it was an hour and 25-minute interview. 
Thanks, guys. I really enjoyed talking to you. And make sure it gets translated for the Korean community. <laughs> uh, yeah, we will. We will. Uh, we'll definitely make that happen. Yeah. Um, anyways, awesome. yes. So, like, yeah, we'll, let's wrap up the show. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, for everyone, for uh, tuning in. Uh, for the blockchainers propagating from the heart of Korea. Telling the world and the internet about everything that is going on in the blockchain crypto ecosystem in Korea. Bringing you news, interviews, general goodness, and that Korean soul. If you like this content, please like, subscribe, and comment below. And if you want to ever collaborate on a project, we're always open to do that. So please contact us. All right. And this was Sian. Uh, this was Yawan. Okay. And our special guest, Ned, Ned Scott. We're, we're signing off. See you next time. Thanks for watching, guys.